I love the smell yeah, of napalm, napalm in, the in the morning. morning. Yeah, absolutely. Did you like doing Apocalypse Now? Very much so. I liked that part a lot. Very much so. You were crazy. Yeah. Well, yeah, he had a, he had a, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> I love the smell of napalm in the morning. It smells like victory. The second half of the enormous Valkyrie sequence would involve even more dangerous helicopter stunts, a seemingly straightforward shot that turned out to be insanely difficult, an extremely large and complicated explosion sequence, as well as one of the most quoted lines in cinema history. <sighs> I love the smell of Pumba in the morning. This is the story behind these and many other great moments in the second half of the Valkyrie sequence. Someday this war is going to end. Extreme prejudice. Are you an assassin? A soldier? A special thanks to Mubi for sponsoring this episode. Get 30 days free by clicking the link in the description. I'm beginning to add sponsorships to this series to help pay for editors, and it would really mean a lot if you take a moment to check out the offer. I'm gonna make him an offer he can refuse. In his commentary for Apocalypse Now Redux, Coppola said that every time you see an interior of a helicopter, it's actually up in the air and flying around as opposed to having a helicopter on the ground being shaken. There are a few interior shots where you can't see outside, and I have to imagine that at least some of these were on the ground. I mean, what's the point? Here, it sort of looks like they are filming something on a platform. Coppola was in the helicopters directing all of the interior shots himself, with cinematographer Vittorio Storaro, and this was even during some of the crazier things they did. Coppola noted that the Filipino pilots were often petrified doing these kinds of things. The part here with the helicopters landing and the American soldiers getting out were some of the more dangerous shots because they had these dolly tracks and several helicopters landing and taking off while extras were running around. The tail rotors would get pretty close to the ground, and all it would take would be someone running the wrong way or a helicopter moving awkwardly as it's taking off, and the tail rotor could have chopped someone to bits. Martin Sheen said, we had some very close calls on those choppers. They were terrifying. We were warned even when they were on the ground not to get too close to the tails. They'd all be in position on the beach, the tails spinning. The noise was terrifying. You could not hear a word. A guy with a mambo stick would whack you if he got too close. Perhaps the most terrified was producer Gray Fredrickson, who said, I was a wreck for about two weeks, with all these explosions and helicopters and everybody running around. There would be all of this smoke going up in the air, and two or three helicopters coming from different directions would be flying into these smoke clouds. I would just sit there, crossing my fingers. Don't let them hit each other up in these clouds. I hope they can see. They could see, obviously, but it was horrifying when you were looking from down below. Then they would have these explosions that would blow these fishnets up into the sky. I'd think, my god, if a helicopter rotor caught one of these fishnets, that would be the end of everybody. It's lucky we didn't get anybody hurt. With the production so far away from the States, it was difficult to find a lot of light-skinned men to play many of the American soldier extras we see in the movie. The Philippines had a school for the children of American businessmen, diplomats, and staff staying in Manila, and many of them were 13 to 14 year old boys that the production could put in uniforms and position in the background of shots. Keep in mind Lawrence Fishburne was still 14 years old when they filmed this sequence. Coppola's sons, as well as a young Charlie Sheen and Emilio Estevez, brought over by their father Martin Sheen, appear as extras in the background of various shots in the movie. Other American soldier extras were played by aspiring doctors who couldn't get into medical schools in the States. Actually, Lee Ermey initially traveled to the Philippines because American universities were too expensive, although when he arrived he found he didn't have enough money for the Philippine universities either, but he stayed and acted in commercials before getting involved with Apocalypse Now. For the extras playing the North Vietnamese soldiers, the production recruited several hundred South Vietnamese people from a refugee camp near Manila. According to Eleanor Coppola, they would rehearse little plays while the production was setting up the next shots. One of the Hueys lands in the village square near the schoolhouse to evacuate some wounded soldiers. In the margins of Milius' script, Coppola wrote, Always remember, this is man-made war at its finest. Everything works like clockwork. I want my wounded out of there in the hospital in 15 minutes. The medic giving water to the wounded soldier is Coppola's nephew, Mark Coppola. On April 22nd, Eleanor Coppola wrote, The whole day was spent in painstaking rigging and rehearsing the scene in the village square where the helicopter lands and they load a wounded GI aboard. 
I tried to shoot the rehearsals with the helicopter landing. We were so close that the rotor blades blew dirt and sand and smoke so hard it lifted me and the tripod off the ground. The main shot, with all its complicated timing of effects, etc., didn't go until about 5.15. Vittorio was really upset because the helicopter didn't land in the exact same place it had during rehearsal, and his camera didn't get the composition he wanted. The next day, the crew was there before 6.30 in the morning, resetting the same shot so Vittorio could get the composition the way he wanted it. Next would come one of stunt coordinator Terry Leonard's most dangerous stunts in the movie. This insane stunt involved the Huey, nine feet above the ground, exploding and crashing to the ground in a fiery wreck with men inside. Leonard and his team wore fireproof suits that Leonard himself designed, which were covered in a flammable liquid. On April 26th, Eleanor Coppola wrote, This morning we are waiting, because the medevac helicopter wasn't called early enough. It was needed to stand by in case anyone was hurt in the big exploding stunt in the square. Now the light has changed. It is starting to sprinkle, and we have to wait for the bright sun to match the shot from the other day. Francis is angry, but instead of yelling, he went over to the jet ranger and is taking a flying lesson. On the day of the actual shot, you can see that the helicopter is on a collapsible platform. It was supposed to look like the helicopter was taking off, but I'm not so sure this translates well in the final film. During the actual stunt, we can see one man fly out of the helicopter and land on a ground panel with some kind of padding hidden underneath. We can see here that another stuntman was inside the helicopter for a good amount of time before climbing out. I wasn't able to find any info on where they got the helicopter that they blew up, but I assume that the production just bought one of the non-operational Hueys from the Philippine government to destroy. Well that's pretty hypocritical coming from a man who just decimated an entire village of people so he could go surfing. Kilgore has no respect for guerrilla warfare, but he gets the job done when you're outgunned. As we can see in Apocalypse Now screenwriter John Milius's Red Dawn, where American high school students go up against the Russian army. Wolverines! The woman and some older civilians run away and are chased by a loach helicopter. The loach does some swift maneuvering, and the soldier inside guns them all down. The loach takes fire from the jungle, and then there is a massive explosion. To me, this seems like the craziest stunt. A helicopter flying in the air has a big explosion go off on the side of it. No computers, no models, it's all done for real. Coppola says that this was his fault. He kept asking the special effects guys to make it bigger, and that Dick White, the pilot, who you'll remember was one of the first Cobra pilots in Vietnam, can handle the explosion. However, the explosion was so big that White actually lost control of the loach for a second. Here you can see how close of a call it actually was, with the loach getting very close to the ground. Coppola said that he was very grateful that no one was killed during the making of Apocalypse Now, and Eleanor Coppola noted that every day the project seems to get bigger. Special effects coordinator Joe Lombardi said, I hate to say it, but this whole movie is special effects. You got three stars but the action's gonna keep the audience on the edge of their seats. What do you think? Wow, it's really exciting, man. No, no, away! Away! The helicopter doors were rigged up with these big safety pins through the hinges so that they could remove the doors and mount a camera quick and easy. Cinematographer Vittorio Storaro said, Francis and I myself did the helicopter interior shots. When Robert Duvall was looking outside the helicopter and down at the waves checking the surf, I was seated outside the machine on a piece of wooden board and perched on an apple crate. I had just one belt holding me in place, and my key grip was holding me with the handheld camera. I was talking to Francis through the earphones. I remember looking through the viewfinder, and I could see one machine behind me, so we would have something in the sky. I kept shouting to Dick, Can you come closer? Closer. Closer. And he said, Are you crazy? The rotors are almost touching. After most of the aerial attack shots were completed, before Kilgore lands on the beach, Eleanor Coppola flew over the Baylor location and looked at the damage that had been done. She wrote, It looks sad now that it was almost destroyed. Charred bamboo skeletons of houses sticking out of the water. Smoke fires were already set on the beach for today's shooting. We landed on the sand and walked up to the village square to see what the first shot setup was starting to look like. They were rigging some palm trees to blow up behind the schoolhouse. It began to rain. 
No one seemed to notice except the extras who got under banana palms or in doorways to keep their costumes dry. Kilgore's Huey lands on the beach near some colored smoke. You know, we started to be like these uh, psychedelic soldiers ourselves and say, wow, look at that yellow smoke, look at that blue smoke. And little by little, the colored smoke began to become a kind of leitmotif of this movie, as you'll see, developing up the river. Leitmotif usually refers to a recurring piece of music that signifies something, like dun-dun, dun-dun, signifies that Jaws is nearby, or a hero's theme music. Here, Coppola is referring to his use of colored smoke to signify when things become more surreal and psychedelic throughout the movie. Sort of like how oranges signify death in The Godfather. But that was apparently just a coincidence. The set designer liked using oranges to add a bit of color to the scenes. The colored smoke motif was revealed to be intentional by Coppola himself. And for as much colored smoke bombs we'll see throughout the movie, it was interesting to find out that they each cost $25. Adjusting for inflation, that would be a little over $90 today. And keep in mind that they would usually do several takes. The colored smoke was integral to the visual style that cinematographer Vittorio Storaro was trying to achieve. He said, When I was planning the visual style for the film, I began thinking that I could convey the conflict of cultures by creating a visual conflict between artificial light and natural light. The first time I saw that we would be using colored smoke to convey specific military messages, I thought it was wonderful because when these artificial colors were placed next to the natural colors of Vietnam, it created that sense of conflict that I wanted. On May 5th, 1976, Eleanor Coppola wrote, We got to the set about 10.30. It was like a real war going on. About eight helicopters circled and landed in smoke flares, ground rocket fire, and water hits. Lines of GIs offloaded and ran up the beach, crouching, firing, and advancing. Between takes, we got a boat to take us close to where the main camera was. We waded ashore with our gear and got up the beach, near enough to get some good shots of Bobby Duvall in his cavalry hat taking the beach. He looked terrific, he knew it, and was real up and radiating energy. Coppola made a note in the script, calling Kilgore, quote, the victor, civilizer in a savage land. When Kilgore doesn't react to a nearby explosion, Coppola writes, he knows he's won. He's invulnerable. There was a problem, though. The production needed a large Chinook helicopter or a flying crane capable of lifting the patrol boat to drop in the river. But the Philippine government didn't have one, and the United States military refused to cooperate with the production. In his letter to Donald Rumsfeld that we talked about earlier, Coppola noted that the John Wayne Vietnam movie The Green Berets was allowed to rent what they needed from the U.S. military. Eleanor Coppola wrote, he really needs a Chinook helicopter to lift the PBR, river patrol boat, into the river for that scene at Village 2. The Philippine Air Force has no lifting helicopters. It seems like the Defense Department is exerting a kind of censorship. A film about World War II gets all sorts of cooperation. By this time, Coppola got a response from Assistant Secretary of Defense William T. Greener, confirming that there were, quote, no Chinook helicopters assigned to the U.S. forces in the Philippines, and there were no U.S. helicopters in the area capable of lifting the eight-ton boat, and that the Department of Defense would not loan Coppola the F-4 Phantoms for the napalm drop without script changes. Producer Gray Fredrickson had budgeted for only two plastic PBRs. I'm assuming they took the engine out of the boat and everything else they could, but when they tried having a Huey lift the boat for the shot, it was still too heavy, and the Huey dropped it into the lagoon, splitting open the fabric wrecking one of their boats. This was four days after filming the napalm explosion, but we'll talk about that in a bit. So the production would have to figure out how to get a shot of a helicopter unable to lift the boat to lift the boat and drop it in the water. The solution was to make a lighter version of the boat just for this shot. Here we can see one of the Hueys holding the boat. And next to it, you can see the size of a Chinook that's actually capable of lifting a real boat. The surfing here is more than just bizarre and interesting. It has a deeper meaning according to screenwriter John Milius. He thought of the Vietnam War as a Californian war, because American culture during that time seemed to be centered around California culture, with the rise of hippies and the soldiers had a Californian aesthetic. According to Milius, all the World War II movies featured characters from New York or the Midwest. He said that the idea for Apocalypse Now was that it was like Asian communist culture clashing with the 60s Californian psychedelic surf culture. That Vietnam 
Indochina had resisted the French, had resisted everything. It's culture. Chinese. Yeah, it resisted the Chinese and, and had absorbed and resisted everything. And now it had had this thin film of communism on it. But underneath was this deep oriental mysticism, this, this wonderful, you know, inscrutable oriental character that was coming up against California, against rock and roll, you know, <laughs> and drugs, you know, and immense firepower. The door song, The End, that opens and closes the movie features the lyric, the West is the best. Get here and we'll do the rest. The Doors was formed in Southern California in 1965 and were a big part of the California culture Milius was talking about. The other reason for the surfing was that Milius had read an article about the Six Day War between June 5th and 10th in 1967 and an Israeli major general named Ariel Sharon who captured the city of Aqaba in Jordan. After Sharon's forces captured the city, Sharon caught and ate some fish that were only found in the Gulf of Aqaba, saying in essence, not only have we captured their city, we're eating their fish. Not only did Kilgore's men capture Charlie's Point, they're surfing Charlie's waves. Charlie, don't surf! This episode's companion PDF features the story of Ariel Sharon in the Six Day War that inspired this scene. It's just one dollar and it really helps the series. Or you can join Cinema Tyler on Patreon at the $5 level and get access to all the companion PDFs I've made. Robert Duvall wanted to know exactly what each surfing term meant and had Milius tell him all about it. I think you're the best comeback there is. Hey, thank you, sir. I didn't cut out the surfcraft lance. I built Kilgore. I'm a goofy fuck. He also went to Malibu to watch the surfers in action. All the big explosions going off on the beach during this portion would blow the water everywhere. You can see here that it almost looks like it's starting to rain. Eleanor Coppola wrote on May 5th, Set dressing is sprinkling bags of dry sand so the beach will not look so wet. During the last take, the water explosions rained down on everything. In the shot, there was green, purple, and yellow smoke, bloody bodies, helicopters landing, GIs taking the beach, and water explosions. Now the wardrobe department is changing the main actors into dry costumes. They're about ready for another take. The helicopters are warming up. The sky is gray with orange, casting unusual light. Everybody is excited and up for this shot. There are so many explosions. The ones in the lagoon are about 150 yards away. When they go off, the beach shakes with a heavy tremor, like an earthquake. A portion that was cut from the movie for the theatrical release, but was put back in for the Redux version, was a moment where Kilgore helps a wounded child and his mother. And he cut it. Why? To this day, I'll never know why he cut it. And it wasn't so much a controversy because the movie didn't come out till what, three years later. Had it come out six months later or a year, I would have been more vehement about it. But it came out so much, it took so long for the movie to come out. So when it came out, it, I felt it was no longer my movie because it was his because it had been so long. But to this day, I mean, they cut to a reconnaissance plane. And here was a guy who saved the life of a baby, probably just to kill the father, sent the mother with it in the helicopter back. And while he's doing it, he's looking at the waves to see if they're good for, for what kind of surfing, you know. And, and it was Francis's idea to put it in there. We had heard it from certain technical advisors, how these interesting contradictions happened. You know, I mean, uh, not to make somebody all one color or whatever. And uh, to me, it was strange to cut it out. I mean, I don't know why. I, I still don't know why. In a separate interview, Duvall said he thought that the moment kept the character from being so black and white. I sort of think Coppola cut it initially to put more focus on the giant spectacle that is the napalm drop, because the Redux version cuts between Kilgore helping the child and the jets approaching with the napalm. When Duvall confronted Coppola about it, Coppola told him that he would put it in when Apocalypse Now went to television. Coppola noted that the moment adds a nice dichotomy between Kilgore ordering the bombing of a tree line and all the NBA soldiers in there to be burned alive by napalm, and at the same time, helping a young child and his mother. And let's not forget, Kilgore's main motivation for ordering the napalm drop was so that Lance would surf. Big Duke 6, Roger, Dub 13, standby. Moving to the Stone Age, son! 
On May 6, the day before filming the napalm explosion, Eleanor Coppola accompanied David Butler on an MU-2 jet to rehearse how they would film the fighter jets in the sky using an AstroVision camera. Here's an example of what an AstroVision rig looks like. Eleanor writes, We took off and got above the clouds. David started looking for the Philippine F-5 fighters to photograph while they rehearsed for tomorrow's shot of the napalm drop. The camera was mounted on the belly of the plane. David operated it by remote control as he looked at a video screen inside the cabin. The co-pilot had a VHF radio pressed to his window, trying to contact the jets. The pilot and David were looking out both sides and yelling over their headsets. The idea was to line up the MU-2 with the Philippine jets and fly as close as possible at an angle so the camera could photograph them. David would yell, Where are they? Where are they? Then the jets would streak past on the left in some other position entirely. David would leap out of his seat yelling and looking out both sides. Meanwhile, Kilgore gives Lance a gift, a pair of special air cav swim trunks. From the air cav, pressing for me and the boys. I want to see you do your stuff in Out there, okay? Here, we can actually see Coppola discussing this moment with Duvall. To get the giant napalm explosion, special effects coordinators A.D. Flowers and Joe Lombardi filled a half-mile-long pipe with 1,200 gallons of gasoline. Flowers, who was in his late 50s, was sick with a fever and losing weight while they were doing this effect. They had to wait because the scene so far had been filmed in overcast, but the sun was out and the light didn't match. At 10.30 a.m. on May 7th, the day of the napalm drop, Eleanor Coppola wrote, The wind is blowing jet fuel exhaust from the helicopters toward us. It is nauseating. Everybody is really hustling because the F-5 jets are coming over at 11 a.m. They can only make three passes. On the third, they'll drop the canisters that look like napalm, and special effects will set off a huge fire in the palm trees using thousands of gallons of fuel. They set it from bunkers dug into the beach. Security has been tightened, but a bunch of kids snuck out onto the set earlier this morning. They are praying they can keep everybody away. The big effects are really dangerous. There is an air of excitement and anticipation. The jets took a half hour to fly to the location. Coppola says that they had five cameras set up to capture the action, although editor Walter Murch says there were six. Everything was ready. Flowers and Lombardi hid in their bunkers dug into the beach. And when the timing was just right, they triggered the explosion. The gasoline lit up in a huge fireball lasting about a minute and a half. Eleanor Coppola, who was about a half a mile away, felt a strong flash of heat and wondered what it must have felt like for the extras on the other side of the lagoon. Editor Walter Murch said that the last camera angle was filming with a telephoto lens that flattened out a close shot of the tree line at 120 frames per second for slow motion, and that was the angle that was eventually used for the opening image of the movie. They were experimenting with sin surround, a type of surround sound, for the sounds of the bombers. What's interesting though is that Walter Murch, who spent a full day working on the sound mix for just the napalm drop, actually used a recording of a real napalm drop that the Swiss Army had made. Murch said, We built on that. The trick is to always articulate it, not to have everything hit at once or else it turns into a ball of mush. You have to let the ear hear fragments of each thing, so that the ear builds it together rather than have the film build it for the audience. And this is where we hear one of the most famous lines of dialogue in cinema history. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Cinematographer Vittorio Storaro said, It doesn't matter to Kilgore how many people are dying. He's somehow enchanted by the beauty of napalm. This is the point of view that Kurtz is denouncing. The line was an invention of screenwriter John Milius. Milius isn't a stranger to iconic lines, having also written, You know the thing about a shark he's got Lifeless eyes, black eyes, like a doll's eyes. Crush your enemies, see them driven before you, they hear the lamentation of their women. You've got to ask yourself one question, do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? A little side note here, in her diary, Elnor Coppola described a moment that was cut from this part of the movie, where a Viet Cong prisoner is shot in the head on the beach. I imagine this might be a reference to the famous Pulitzer Prize-winning photo of a Viet Cong member about to be executed. There was a long discussion about how the actor should fall to hide the blood tube break to his back, and in the behind-the-scenes footage on the Final Cut Blu-ray, we actually get to see a shot of the man with the blood tube. Apparently, the military advisor on set said if the man was shot at close range with a 45 pistol, it would blow the man's head off and it wouldn't matter how he fell. Maybe that's why they cut it. 
Kilgore's napalm drop made the beach safe to surf, but the explosion caused the wind to change, ruining the waves. It's blown on shore! It's coming on shore! It's gonna blow this place out! It's gonna ruin it! Not cool! Kilgore begs Lance to wait 20 minutes, but Lance and Willard make their way toward the boat. Filming the Valkyrie sequence was, as you can imagine, extremely taxing on Coppola. It was taking much longer than anticipated, and he was stressed and depressed, and wondering if the production was going to fall apart before it really began. This shot of Kilgore throwing the megaphone in anger at losing his chance to surf with Lance was actually Duvall doing an impression of the way Coppola would throw his radio in frustration while filming this sequence. The radios were expensive, and get this, there was actually a crew member assigned to try and get the radio from Coppola before he threw it. During the time they were trying to get Steve McQueen to play Willard, Coppola wanted Willard to take on Kilgore and outdo him somehow. John Milius had grown up studying literature, and while writing these scenes, he thought of Kilgore as being similar to the Cyclops in Homer's The Odyssey, and Willard would have to fool him by using surfing. So Willard uses surfing and Kilgore's admiration for Lance to manipulate him into doing what he needs. Sky with you? Yeah. That's Charlie's point. Sir, we can go in there tomorrow at dawn. There's always a good offshore breeze in the morning. I know! I'm really sorry, Colonel, but I'm afraid that doesn't! I mean, the kid's got a reputation you can't expect to surf those sloppy waves! Milius had written in the script a part here where Lance and Willard are running for the boat. Suddenly, Lance sees something and stops. Willard continues. In a pile of equipment that the Hueys have left are two surfboards. Lance runs over. Lance grabs the nearest one and dashes down through the water. In the margins, Coppola wrote, Willard should steal it and risk his life to do it. That might tell us something interesting about Willard, that he'd risk his life to steal Kilgore's surfboard. This didn't appear in the theatrical cut because Coppola thought people would think the movie was too strange and long but it was put back in for Redux and the other versions. But we were very anxious to kind of make the film at first into more of a conventional war film. So we even cut out that nice opening where the helicopter land, lands and, and uh, Kilgore steps out. We saved a little time there. We saved the stealing of the boards. We cut out the, you know, we cut out a lot of stuff. Oh yeah. And then later on, it sort of, the movie started, the people kept going to see it at the Cinerama Dome. And then I, many years later, we said, well, let's put it all back in, you know? And, and, and that's how it comes that there are two versions. Back when Kilgore was still called Colonel Carnage, Coppola wrote, Maybe Willard had to trick Carnage to make this happen. A wily Ulysses. He succeeded in accomplishing this aspect of his mission. At this point, Willard must have won us over to him, and we must be clear as to the process that has begun within him. By the time Coppola finished shooting the Valkyrie sequence, the first major test for his vision, he began to realize that the classic war movie ending they had in the script was not going to work. Coppola could see that the movie was taking him in a more and more surreal direction. I want to take a moment to thank this episode's sponsor, Mubi. Mubi is a curated streaming service tailor-made for cinephiles like you. Mubi features a lineup of great films, handpicked by experts, not an algorithm, that take you on a guided journey through the best that cinema has to offer, with a new film added every single day. What's really cool is how Mubi curates their releases into retrospectives, specials, and specific subgenres. It's like having your own personal film festival that you can stream anytime, anywhere. Right now, you can check out Palo Alto, based on James Franco's short stories and directed by Francis Ford Coppola's granddaughter, Gia Coppola. Or check out Jeff Nichols' indie classic, Mud, following two boys who try to help a fugitive on the run. All of this and much, much more are available right now on Mubi. Try Mubi free for 30 days at mubi.com slash cinematyler. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash cinematyler for a whole month of great cinema for free. Or join Cinematyler on Patreon at the $5 level and get extended access to Mubi as a perk. 